Whether an awakened one appears or not, this condition exists and is a natural fact, a natural law, that is, the principle of conditionality. Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination, stands as one of the few ideas that the Buddha Gautama taught as a fundamental doctrine, and it is upon his complete realization of its mechanism on the night of his awakening that he founded the teachings he would give until his death. The general formula of dependent origination, exclaimed by the newly awakened Buddha after a seven-day period of intense meditation, is as follows. When this is, that is. From the rising of this comes the rising of that. When this isn't, that isn't. From the cessation of this comes the cessation of that. Paticca Samuppada is a teaching that describes not only how we remain in the suffering that is samsara, but also how we may transcend it by creating the necessary conditions for awakening. The Buddha taught his teaching in several different ways. The most well-known form of describing the all-encompassing teaching is found in the description of the Twelve Nidana, describing the twelve major links in the circle of suffering that is samsara. A description of the Nidana and their places in samsara is found in the Udana book of the Kudaka Nikaya and is as follows. From ignorance as a requisite condition come fabrications. From fabrications as a requisite condition come consciousness. From consciousness as a requisite condition comes name and form. From name and form as a requisite condition come the six sense media. From the six sense media as a requisite condition comes contact. From contact as a requisite condition comes feeling. From feeling as a requisite condition comes craving. From craving as a requisite condition comes clinging. From clinging as a requisite condition comes becoming. From becoming as a requisite condition comes birth. From birth as a requisite condition comes old age, death, and the sorrow and lamentation that come into play. Such is the origination of this entire mass of stress and suffering. Ignorance in the Buddha's philosophy is not ignorance of a particular piece of knowledge. It is the inability to discern the true nature of whatever one is presently experiencing. Most often ignorance has been described as not seeing one's experience within the framework of the Four Noble Truths. In terms of the Eightfold Path, it is the absence of right view. The Buddha described right view in this way. Knowledge with reference to stress. Knowledge with reference to the origination of stress. Knowledge with reference to the cessation of stress. Knowledge with reference to the way of practice leading to the cessation of stress. Ignorance also refers to the lack of skill with reference to the duties of each of the four noble truths. The first noble truth is to be comprehended. The second noble truth, the cause of stress, is to be abandoned. The third noble truth is to be directly experienced. And the fourth noble truth, the Eightfold Path, is to be developed. Ignorance is a principal cause, though not the first cause, within the Buddha's system of Paticca Samuppada. No first ignorance can be perceived, monks, before which ignorance is not and after which it came to be, but it can be perceived that ignorance has its specific conditions. Ignorance is intricately interlaced with all the other factors of dependent origination of suffering. If one can experience any of the other links without ignorance, the entire chain of suffering can be broken. With ignorance as a requisite condition, sankhara or fabrications arise. These fabrications have been described in various ways, 
such as habits or grooves of the mind. The literal translation of Sankara is that which has been put together. The Theravadan Buddhist Bhikkhu Bodhi describes Sankara in this way. Sankara are the karmically active volitions responsible for generating rebirth and thus for sustaining the onward movement of samsara, the round of birth and death. The fabrications are divided into three types, bodily fabrications, verbal fabrications and mental fabrications. The nun Dharmadina, praised by the Buddha as his foremost female disciple, describes the types of fabrications thus. In and out breathing is bodily, bound up with the body, therefore it is called a bodily fabrication. Having directed one's thought and evaluated, one breaks into speech, therefore directed thought and evaluation are called verbal fabrications. Perception and feeling are mental, bound up with the mind, therefore perception and feeling are called mental fabrications. Vijnana, or consciousness, is the next Nidana. The six most well-known examples of consciousness described by the Buddha are eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, mouth consciousness, touch consciousness, and mental consciousness. These consciousnesses are named by their relationship to the sense bases and can be described as the field of awareness within which the senses are known. Fire is named from that independence on which it burns. The fire which burns independence on logs of wood is called a log fire. The, d the fire which burns independence on chips is called a chip fire. The fire which burns independence on husks is called a husk fire. In exactly the same way, O oh monks, consciousness is named from that independence on which it comes into being. The third Nidana is seen by some to be a type of rebirth consciousness, an Atman or soul of sorts, eternal and independent. The consciousness the Buddha describes in his teachings indicate a much less idealistic view. He describes several types of consciousness, all changing and without a fundamental good or bad nature. Each moment, all of the varying consciousnesses are changing and empty of inherent substance. Now suppose that a magician or magician's apprentice were to display a magic trick at a major intersection, and a man with good eyesight were to see it, observe it, and appropriately examine it. To him, it would appear empty, void, without substance. For what, what substance would there be in a magic trick? In the same way, a monk sees, observes, and appropriately examines any consciousness that is past, future, or present internal or external, blatant or subtle, common or sublime. To him, seeing it, observing it, and appropriately examining it, it would appear empty, void, and without substance. For what substance would there be in consciousness? The fourth link in the traditional representation of the Nidana is Nama Rupa, name and form. Name refers to the collective mental, feeling, perception, intention, contact and attention, and physical, earth, air, water, fire, phenomena. Four of the five aggregates, namely form, feeling, intention and perception, are found in name and form. Nama Rupa is very closely linked to consciousness and an excellent example of the complex way in which Paticca Samupada works is given by the monk Shariputra when asked to explain their relationship. It is as if two sheaves of reeds were to stand leaning against one another. In the same way, from name and form as a requisite condition comes consciousness. From consciousness as a requisite condition comes name and form. The fifth nidana, salayatana, or sense faculties, consists of the five sense faculties, the eye, the ear, the tongue, the nose, and the body, and the intellect or mind. 
The sense objects, that which is touched, heard, etc., are often also included. These are known collectively as the internal and external sense media. The Buddha taught that contact with external sense media should not be glorified, but minified. In one passage, he likens the internal sense media to wounds. And how does a monk not dress wounds? There is the case where a monk, on seeing a form with the eye, grasps at themes or details by which evil, unskillful qualities such as greed or distress might assail him. He doesn't practice with restraint. He doesn't guard the faculty of the eye. He doesn't achieve restraint with regard to the faculty of the eye. This is how a monk doesn't dress wounds.